so yep. you came from an authoritarian government. You were not allowed to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a free thinker and a secularist. You've, you've laid out why you can't, you know, lived under an authoritarian rule. And now we see this happening here. And yeah. I, I'm firmly, I firmly believe that we are in like some really murky waters in America right now and in the West in general. So what do we do to fight this? Well, I mean, there. Are, I mean, there is a. I think a domestic because now is 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 coming to our lands here, and it's happening over there. And uh, when it comes to what's happening over there, I mean, I think the best solution for is to support the values that I think that are, to be on the right side of history on this battle between yeah. authoritarianism, and I would include theocratic fascism in the in the umbrella yeah. and. Uh, and the the, va the values of John Stuart Mill and Teverson and uh, the values of of the free man. Yeah. And, uh, but do you think? Do you guys think that those are values of the left anymore? When you think of John Stuart Mill or classic uh, liberalism, it seems to me that that's not even a value that really is, yeah, is understood the left, by the left. I mean, the left has shifted and the right has shifted. Like now, we live in a. I mean, you can look at the elections and you can see for yourself. Like we live in a very polarized. I mean, there's there's no there's polar discussion about everything. Like <laughs> like you can start like whether it's Islam or abortion or gun control or a glass of water. Like like yeah. and one of the things like one of the things that I like because like it's like a, it's a dogma and like you can actually know, someone know, know like someone position from abortion about abortion and gun control by asking them one question. Right. You can tell them like what do you think about abortion and then you can actually know their position on gun control. Yeah. Because it's like now is like hmm. this polarization of like dogmatism of the the Ten Commandments of the left and the Ten Commandments of the right. And so I think that both sides have kind of lost principles. I mean, even the quote unquote the right. I mean, they are supposedly about the free market, but they want to police people's uh, vagina. And uh, so they, they're not <laughs> right. as uh, they're not as free uh, as, they, as they claim to be. I mean, they want to police marriage and, and they are against marriage equality. They want to police a woman's uh, reproductive rights and stuff. Yeah. And the left want to supposedly they're, the guys of free speech want to have a police uh, so then is the sad part here, if we're jumping onto the political side of this, that the one guy who wanted smaller government, the one guy yes, who wanted Rand Paul. Go, Rand Paul, who wanted, you know, who's as close to a libertarian that we're going to get in the mainstream parties. Now, I had Gary Johnson on here a couple weeks ago, who's running under the libertarian ticket. Unfortunately, good luck. We, yeah, a good luck yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still don't have a legitimate, a, a truly legitimate third party yet. But I think that after the craziness of this year, I actually think it's possible for 2020. But is that the real fault, so we focus on the left, but there was a moment that the right could have said, all right, maybe this is the guy that we should listen to because he's got some of our principles, and then they kicked him out after I, I think, one bad caucus. I think it was actually Islamic um, extremism, what was going on in the Middle East that really did Rand Paul's campaign in the rise of ISIS and, and you know, the, the havoc that was wrecking the refugees. It, it sort of it sort of implicated that the United States couldn't be as isolationist and, and the libertarian position is to just, you know, hold back. So yeah. I think that's what kind of killed um, Rand Paul's, Rand Paul's uh, campaign. Yeah, it was interesting because when I had Gary Johnson on, I didn't know what his policy was on, because a libertarian really, you can, you don't have to be so like, just like this and so yeah. narrow and everything. So when I asked him about some Middle East stuff and some foreign policy stuff, yeah. he actually did feel that there is still a role for the, for United, the United States. States. Yeah. Uh, didn't really lay out exactly what it was, yeah, that's but I totally think that that's case, kind yeah. of really interesting. I, I mean, uh, with the Libertarian Party, I've seen it's like, yeah, uh, uh, as Melissa mentioned, is this concept of isolationism, which yeah. is very strong in the. But the thing is, like, if you're not interested in the Middle East, the Middle East is interested in you. Yeah. <laughs> but what happens in the Middle East doesn't. It's not Las Vegas. Like, what happens in Iraq doesn't stay in Iraq. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like the, even though we have the same weather between Vegas and Iraq, but there is yeah. one thing that does that's that doesn't stay over there. Yeah. And uh, and that one thing is Islamic extremism. And I mean, because one of the good things about Islam, and I always admit it, it's like it is the least least racist religion, and it is very universal, and it always talks about universal values. I mean. One of the famous quotes of, of Prophet Muhammad, in which he said, "There is no difference between Arab and non-Arab, except by um, like, I think how much faithful he is." Right. So, like, so that's so that. Well, that's universal, except he was saying you you have to convert. Yeah, it's religion. Yeah. So no, no, it's, but but the values uh, transcend borders. Is that you can be uh, like the values of Islam can transcend borders, not like a tribal religion, let's say like Judaism is. Right. Like with with Islam, so. 
what affects what's happening in the Middle East can affect like many people who are recruiters for ISIS are in the Middle East, but they're recruiting on the internet for people living in the West. Right, so. but I'm I'm failing to see how you see this as a positive thing because it isn't that showing why it's spreading. No, but, I mean it, it is. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. Is that it's a good thing that it's not racist, but it's a bad thing that is universal. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay. So I was like, 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 I would skew that as a little more bad. Yeah. Than good. But so, but all right. So back yeah. to the isolationists. Is yeah. Many of the isolationists believe that if we can just secure the borders, if you can ban. Uh, everybody from entering or whatever. Even the libertarians are kind of contradictory because they believe in open borders at the same time. Right. Yeah. They're reducing the welfare state, so in that way we can accept more immigrants. So, yeah, how are we going to deal with that? Like yeah. with, the, with the Islamic extremism rising up, with the refugees coming in, with people from the West getting recruited to join terrorist groups that may actually make attacks here in the West, like Paris attacks and Charlie Hebdo. And even like now, some like my friend just recently came from Germany. She's a woman from Afghanistan. And she said, like, in, in some hotels, telling they are telling women not to go out at night, out of fear of being harassed by the newcomers. Right, and which then ultimately just strengthens the far right. Exactly. I, I tweeted yeah. this morning. Um, I saw I saw an article in Germany that at one of the public pools where a lot of the, the mm. migrants are going to, that there were there were a lot of men that were attacking women and children. So now their their resolution is that they're going to segregate by sex. So in a weird way, now the government came in and did the most sort of the thing that religion would want the most. Now right. we're going to separate right. men yeah. and women. And guess uh, what? When people aren't having sex, uh, as Bill Maher would say, that's sort of fertile ground for, for extremism. For extremism. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I mean, uh, I think the horseshoe theory is like one of the best ways to explain mm -hmm. things. Is like not, uh, not also the horseshoe theory is like how much they feed into each other. Is mm -hmm. that the more people say that there is no problem with Islam, the more people on the far right will be getting more powerful because yeah. whenever, because there is a correlation between rise of terrorist attacks and rise of far-right groups. And not the side of rise of far-right groups, but the need for them to get mobilized. And mm -hmm. like people like Trump or people like the EDL, English Defense League, or uh, Marie Le Pen in France, that when the terrorist attacks happen, the moment is like, let's get mobilized. Let's, let's, uh, uh, we're losing our way of life and stuff. So, I mean, this is one of kind of like the biggest issues. I mean, we were talking about it a few days ago, is that with the rise of the far right, when they start, quote unquote, killing Muslims or want to attack Muslims and all of that, they're not only, they're attacking people who look Muslim as right. well. They're, I mean, I, I don't have a, right. no a, one's a hashtag on my face saying I'm not a Muslim, but, but <laughs> even I'm not gonna advocate for attacking Muslims either. I mean, my parents are Muslims, I grew up with Muslims, I love many of them, but I don't want, so what's happening is that when people do not acknowledge the problem, there's, these guys are gonna be, and they're going to be attacking Sikhs, and they're going to be attacking uh, anybody who looks brown. Right, and so that's the problem, is that there absolutely are true racists, right? There absolutely are true bigots. bigots. Yeah. By the way, that's why I had Tommy Robinson on my show. I don't agree with everything he says, and I don't fully understand everything about what's going on in, in the UK and Europe, but I'm trying to learn. And I know he had tried to, at least from what I understand, separated himself from some of the more racist elements of the EDL and some of those organizations. So I thought it was worthy of a conversation. But I think this is a good segue to something you said earlier. So a certain in Singapore, a certain amount of authoritarianism, it sounds like it made people coexist. And is that on sort of- On the surface. On yes, the surface, so is that sort of a, it's a very like, you gotta thread that needle really carefully, right? Yeah, um, you know, it, 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 ultimately it's, it's a political philosophy question also, what is the purpose of government, right? Um, is, it, is it to maintain the most stable society? Is it to raise the standard of living of most people? And do the ends ultimately justify the means? Mm -hmm. Because to get there, you know, there, for example, like we, in 2007, we've had, uh, if you make racist comments on your blog, you can be jailed. Um, so you're not free to, to, to make these comments. And how, how else does that manifest, right? So in the United States, anybody can say any racist thing they want. Um, you'll never be thrown into jail for that. Yeah. And Not yet, anyway. You might be booted off Twitter. But, but also, well, uh, I mean, the word racist, I mean, it, it, what, is, what is, could be perceived as racist can get you in jail. Like, right. Not necessarily what we probably all know what racism is. is yeah. that, it could be something that do you say like, oh, Arabs are good people could be something that's racist. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it's a good racism for me, but yeah. But yeah. The, 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 the sedition and blasphemy laws is essentially you know, protect also the criticism of religion, religious institutions from 
often very necessary criticism, right? It's like yeah. you can't even go there, you can't critique. And and it, it creates that climate where where people just don't question because they're afraid. Yeah. And they don't talk about they just there are these like safe spaces, right? And now let's not go talking about um, Let's not go talking about religion. We can't. We can discuss racism very well in Singapore. Like it's a very sensitive. Let's not talk about it. So people tread on eggshells, and and I mean it's funny because I, I feel like I, I sort of escaped that that scenario, like the you know right sort of like top down government instituted curtailing of the freedom of speech. Come to the U.S. and slowly on campuses, what starts happening is now the left asking for the same thing. The students are asking for safe spaces. What you said about the segregation in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's what religion is doing. It's that, creating a safe space between men and women. Yeah. So, like what Faisal said, the horseshoe theory, it does come together. Yeah. You know, it, it, yeah. the left and the right, the extreme left, the effectively are kind of achieving the same result. Yeah, but, but also like worth mentioning about like Singapore or even like. Uh, can you believe I'm actually from Asia? I'm actually yeah. from the same continent. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. the thing about Asia, I mean, I'll try uh, to keep that in mind. Uh, when I'm judging you for now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that within? I mean, a or Eastern uh, uh, cultures, there is a lot of sense of collectivism. Yes. And the, and the concepts of tribalism that makes it easier yes. for leaders to tell them. Like they're, I mean, they're in the philosophy of Buddhism and Confucian Confucianism. Yeah, yeah especially Confucianism, yeah. that there's always respect to the leader and like so like it's, it's generally like a culture itself. Even China is like a yeah. Is like, so so what's happening is that so many people like when they talk about change in the Middle East and things of that sort. And generally in Eastern culture, you will see that you don't need to create a critical mass. Because you don't need to change most of individuals because it's a collective culture. If you yeah. change the leader and the leader telling people to, I mean, look at Iraq, for example, within, if you look at the history of Iraq within the last 50 years, you see 50 years ago, women were as free and some places are in Europe, you know? Mm -hmm. And the moment that the leadership changed, they killed some civil society activists and stuff. The moment everybody starts worshiping and yeah. then, and, and, and so on. So, like. Did, did you see, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you see this meme? about, uh, there was about 30 women from different countries. Yes. You saw this, 30 yeah. women or 50 women maybe from different countries, mostly Arab countries or at least Muslim majority countries, showing what their, what their actual dress, the indigenous dress oh, of yeah, the yeah, women yeah. is supposed to be and it's all vibrant and they're free yeah. in their clothes and it says it's not supposed to be this and then they show women. Yeah, and, and, and that, one of the point. things that like, what, the ideology of Wahhabism and I mean, Wahhabism what calls, used to call himself, Hamd Abdel Wahhab, is called himself a Muslim reformer, that he wanted to make all the Muslim world homogeneous. And that's part of some of his success because they're appealing to this concept that, oh, we all have different humans and sorry, different cultures and stuff, but here am I bringing all of you under one caliphate or under one ideology. And all women need to wear the same dress and all men, need, and it's appealing to some people and not appealing to those who are cultured. Right. right? But that's one of the reasons has been to some extent successful because it appeals to the people who want to have the collective mindset, who want to be like part of one umbrella and mm -hmm. one leadership. And that's what in Arabic is called ummah. That's where the word ummah, the Islamic ummah or the Arabic ummah come from, is that yeah. this concept of one leadership and one community and, and all of that. So the three of us sitting here, three secular people, yeah. atheists, right? So you grew up Methodist. I didn't even know that until we sat down just yeah. now. You grew up Muslim, right? Uh, to some extent. To, I, I mean, my parents are liberal, but yeah. But I grew up in a Muslim culture. In a, yeah. Certainly in a Muslim culture. Yeah. I, I grew up Jewish. I still yes. consider myself Jewish, but I'm not a believer in, in, a, in a magical... Yeah. You don't believe in the talking donkey? I don't believe in the talking donkey or the fire that talks and all that stuff and the way, you know. Um, but it's ideas that brought us all here. And that's yeah. why I wanted to have you two on together because I think that that's really interesting. It shows that these concepts are irrelevant, you know, th these concepts transcend borders and all of that stuff. So it's, it's pretty So I really, good. like, what really um, interested me about sort of joining forces with, with Faisal, especially right now with the shift that, that he's doing with uh, human rights. He's focusing, you know, not just on the, the, the atheist movement or the secular movement, well, what, what can we do about it? So he's now working in human rights. And, and the reason I'm, I'm so supportive of that and, and want to be involved in that is because for me, you know, I grew up in a country where I think one of the, 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 the founding father of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who, who recently passed away, one of the most dangerous legacies, he's probably one of the greatest statesmen, modern statesmen, you know, um, ever. And he's built a country that went from third world to first world in just three decades. It's a feat that 
I mean, it's it's amazing what mm -hmm. he's done for the country. But um, on the other hand, he sort of legitimized this term, which kind of bothers me. It's, it, he says that it's called Asian values, that because Asia, because of Asia's history and culture, um, the Western ideas of, of, you know, liberal democracy cannot apply and it doesn't fit well within the culture and he uses Confucianism as a bulwark against that, like what he was saying about collectivism. And, and so it, it sort of pits, you know, the West, Western ideas and it says, oh, it's invalid here, it can work here. And to me, that is cultural relativism, you know, it, it violates uh, human rights, like it's it's not it's not consistent with this. Right. Concept. So he's saying he's saying sort of be free, but not that free because that's sort of what'll undermine what we've built. He, well, here. well, they are re they legitimize. They're able to legitimize repressive policies under the guise right. of Asian values. It's almost like exceptionalism. Yeah. Like you know, we we prioritize social harmony and prosperity over individual freedom. So and this is our culture. Yeah. So so our policies fit that. And I think for me, that was what was very dangerous about that idea. And you start seeing it being replicated in Russia, like Putin's doing that, um, mm -hmm. by uh, Xi Jinping in China. And, and they're taking the leaf out of his book now and, and creating almost like parallel alternative to Western democracy. Yeah, and part of that, again, goes to the way we see Europe having so many problems right now, and we don't see those problems in Russia, right? I mean, cer certainly the, the immigration stuff, yeah. we don't see that in Russia, and because of that, then it makes, probably to the average European, but, but, it makes Putin look kind of good, even if they don't like Trump loves doing. Putin, they, or, they're or like, Trump. so, yeah. yeah. But, but exactly. also, it's worth mentioning that Russia is not a country worth immigrating to. So, I, I mean, <laughs> right, they want to be, Snowden. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, as somebody who is a refugee himself, Russia He wanted to go uh, somewhere warm. Yeah, not necessarily warm, but I want to have a country that is probably different than where I come from in terms of authoritarianism, is that, I mean, Europe, I mean, obviously, it's much better economically and much better socially. That is, makes less people. But, but yeah, I mean, I mean, when you have an open border policy, that's I think Germany probably have it, and mm -hmm. the, the not not a very strong vetting system. You're gonna have because as I said, there's a rise of far right and uh, Islamic terrorist attacks. And if you are not going to support the reformers and the liberals or trying to change the things in these societies, because I mean, I, I wrote an, uh, an article about the Syrian refugee crisis. And one of the main issues is that if there is no solution to Syria, these refugees are going to keep coming. Yeah. So if you're not going to find the solution over there, then it's it, this issue is going to continue all the time. So and not only Syria and it's, obviously it's, Libya is also having a problem, Ethiopia and all of the other countries in the region, mm -hmm. and obviously Iraq since uh, kind of a long time. But the, if we're not going to find solutions over there, so other than just like uh, focus on domestic issues, that's where like libertarianism fails because it always deals with the refugees are coming in. But how can we reduce the amount of refugees that are coming in from that region? That's by not necessarily military intervention, but at least being on the right side of history and being with the people who support the values that reduce the amount of refugees. Right. I suspect that most libertarians would say, somebody like Rand Paul would say, well, I wasn't for the Iraq war, yeah. Yeah, but, so, but that's so I didn't add to the chaos. Right. It's irrelevant now, because yeah. here we are now. No, no, but, but, but I but think that is not enough. I mean, this concept of like, well, but I'm not a racist. It's not enough to to defeat racism. Because there's there's things yeah, in motion. Yeah, and, and 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 I mean, people talk about the numbers and stuff. I mean, Saddam Hussein killed hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. If the U.S. did not intervene, there will also be hundreds of thousands of people killed. So so just because saying oh I'm against the Iraq War doesn't somebody make him a good person? You know what I mean? I mean, I'm talking about practical solutions for. I mean, the war happened, and we have to deal with it. <laughs>